Today's gospel makes it clear to us why Jesus' public ministry ended up on the cross. It was not really because he had said anything against the Roman government that he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. It was rather because he had touched some raw nerves in the temple administration. There were certain things that he said about financial abuses that so angered the temple authority figures who happened to be supportive of the Roman imperial government. These were the ones who labeled Jesus as a terrorist and succeeded in getting the Roman government to have him arrested on the allegation that he was inciting people to sedition or plotting to overthrow the government. There was really no such thing as a due process for him. There was only a semblance of a trial that was fast-tracked by his detractors. They managed to use the Roman government's anti-terrorist law as a weapon against legitimate dissenters like Jesus. As soon as they got him convicted, they immediately distanced from the case and kept mum, as if they had nothing to do with it. But let me ask now the question, what was Jesus guilty of? He was guilty of being too critical of the, ruling, of the ruling Jewish authorities. He was found to be blunt in his words of calling a spade a spade with regard to abuses. In Matthew chapter 23, he has even harsher words. He calls them serpents or a brood of vipers. Listen to what he said in today's gospel. They devour the house of widows and as a pretext recite lengthy prayers. In short, he had openly accused them of corruption and of turning religion into a business and an opportunity to suck out the blood of the poor. You know, there is another biblical character who also did something like this. The prophet Daniel. In chapter 13 of the Catholic version of the book of Daniel, we have an interesting story of Daniel's conflict with the priests of the Babylonian god, Bel. The supposed setting is the exile, and we are told that the Babylonian priests had succeeded in turning their religion into a lucrative racket. They conditioned the people into believing that their god, Bel, demanded rich offerings of grains and olives and meats of animals, wine and oil, because their god needed a lot of food. They also threatened the people that their god would get angry if he went hungry. So, hindi dapat magutom daw ang Diyos. Magagalit siya. He would punish them. The hero in the story is a prophet who boldly challenges their racket and gains the ire of the king. Well, unlike Jesus, Daniel is a little more successful. He is able to prove his point that it was not their God who was eating up all the offerings, but rather the priests and their wives and their children, whom they were hiding in a hidden chamber. In the end, Daniel gets vindicated. You know this funny little story, which you probably never even read in the Bible, it's not really about Babylonian priests, 
I am more inclined to believe that it was written to caricature the ruling priestly class of the Jerusalem temple and to criticize them for the abuses that they were committing. It was something of an anti-temple polemic. The point of the story is very clear to me. God does not need burnt offerings and sacrifices. And the prophets of the Old Testament have pointed this out many, many times. Why? Because the people tended to think that they could get away with murder and corruption by just offering costly sacrifices to the temple. They regarded them as shortcut to salvation. Do you remember that song that was sung by Peter, Paul, and Mary, entitled, All My Trials, Lord? You remember the line that says, If religion were a thing that money could buy, then the rich will live and the poor will die. Basically the same message. You know, Israel was required to do tithing. They paid tithes, meaning 10% of all their earnings. But it was clear to them in their tradition that it was not an offering to God. They were rather their obligation to the priestly family of the Levites because the Levites did not get their share or portion when the promised land was divided because they were told to regard only God as their portion and their cup. This has been an issue among the prophets already centuries before the time of Jesus Christ. In Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 7, we hear the prophet saying, With what shall I come before the Lord? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves, with rams, or with streams of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn child for all my sins? Then the answer of the prophet follows. It is the answer of God. Verse 8 says, You have been told, O mortal, what is good and what the Lord is requiring of you. Only to do justice and to love goodness and to walk humbly with your God. We have this too in Psalm 51. Do you remember the line that says, For in sacrifices you take no delight, burnt offering from me you would refuse. My sacrifice is a contrite spirit, a humble and contrite heart you will not spurn. So what Jesus and the prophets before him were pointing out in their critique of burnt offerings and sacrifices was really the tendency to develop an attitude of false righteousness, as if they could buy their way to heaven, as if God owed them a debt of gratitude for what they were offering. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his disciples not to imitate those who blow trumpets in order to call attention to themselves when they are doing their almsgiving. In one of the weekday prefaces that is prayed at Mass, there is a line that expresses this very beautifully. In fact, it's one of my favorites. It says to God, You have no need of our prayers. Maybe you can replace prayers there with offerings. You have no need of our offerings. Yet our desire to thank you is itself your gift. Our prayer of thanksgiving adds nothing to your greatness, but makes us grow in your grace. The logic of Christianity, my brothers and sisters, is this. God is not asking for 10% of your income. He is demanding 100% of your life. What pleases God is when we learn to live our whole lives as gifts, 
as a thanksgiving offering. This is what the Catholic doctrine calls our participation in the common priesthood, the priesthood of holiness of life. The challenge to follow the way of Jesus, Jesus who is both the priest and the victim. He is both the offerer and the offering. Unlike the priests of the Old Testament who will say, I will offer a lamb for your sins. Jesus will not say, I will offer a lamb. Rather, he will say, I will be the lamb. I will offer my life for you. His gift is not a token sacrifice. His gift is his whole life. 